Dev for the league crew. Well, um. DJ Cash, what up? How did people fuck you? We can't stay fly for 595. No wonder we take rides down I 95. I try to stay sane. Sometimes I stay high. It got me through the pain. It's a shame to get by. Before I begin, I said perfect that the title of this video was supposed to be something different, but I recognize that there are some words on YouTube that are banned, so go play by the rules a little. It's not all bad though, because it really, it's. Re if we don't pay attention to our dollar, politicians are not going to pay us the attention we deserve. In today's America, I really do feel like anybody has the opportunity to rise to the occasion. Now, uh, victimhood has become almost a mental plague upon black America in particular. I, I just keep hearing like systemic oppression, this, that, and the third. Like, yeah, we get it. I know. Like, we all know. Like, we all know. But the opportunities are still there. Will you have to work a little bit harder to get to 400 years? Absolutely. For 400 years? That sounds like a choice. <laughs> like, he was there for 400 years and it's all of y'all? There's a contingent of black people who when confronted with the conversation regarding issues surrounding ethnicity and the issues we face, they tend to offer up answers that range from the following. An overwhelming majority of black issues would be resolved if we just stopped looking for handouts and did something about it ourselves. Instead of blaming white people for all our problems, we should instead form our own business and champion em Instead, I can't even say this with like a straight faith. Instead of blaming white people for all our problems, we should instead form our own businesses and champion entrepreneurship within our community. This means supporting black banks, black businesses, and abandoning preconceived notions of victimhood. The system won't change, we've been talking about the same things forever. It's time we pulled ourselves up from our bootstraps and used our power as consumers to do something about it. This popularized notion of pinning the responsibility on black people for their circumstances wasn't just some idea conjured out of nowhere by grifters and miscellaneous motivational speakers. While perpetuated, these ideas don't even originate from the black community at large. President Nixon was one of the first people to actively perpetuate black capitalism as a solution. The catchy and promising phrase, black capitalism, became the language of Richard Nixon, promised during his election campaign that his administration would step up loans and other aid for Negroes to start their own businesses. As Nixon put it, the government should act decisively to help Negroes gain their fair piece of the action. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> Ooh, okay. As Nixon put it, the government should act decisively to help Negroes gain their fair piece of the action. Rather the general idea that Negroes should lift themselves up through business ownership, as many other ethnic groups has done in the US, inspired hope and some votes among people of all races. To the extent that programs of black capitalism are successful, said Nixon, ghettos will gradually disappear. Now, I want you to keep in mind exactly who Richard Nixon is. This is the same administration who, according to his advisor, orchestrated the war on drugs in a clear effort to target black people. I've read this before, but <laughs> quickly do it again. The Nixon campaign in 1969 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to either be against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So what exactly does this mean? Surely if black people were categorically considered an enemy of the administration, Nixon wouldn't be encouraging us to get in on the action. The answer is obvious when you think about what they really wanted to try and avoid. COINTELPRO was a counterintelligence program introduced with the singular purpose of neutralizing black radical thought and movements. I don't need to cover the sheer amount of black political figures they targeted and spied on through the program, but the main thing I want to hone in on here is the very fact that this was always primarily the government's main fear. It's why black political figures are liberalized within the media. It's why the conversation in the public eye is completely reframed as liberals versus conservatives. That's dangerous. That's a threat. We, we, we really don't want to hear it. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm the founder of 23 different radical leftist organizations. The Black Panthers were a black radical leftist group. They were public enemy number one because inciting and educating black youth on black radical thought is the scariest concept to the government. Why do you think it's so stigmatized? You'll see Jay-Z, you won't see Fred Hampton. You'll see Killer Mike, you ain't gonna see Angela Davis. Paraphrasing the words of Dr. Jared Ball, the propaganda of black bowing power isn't just to neutralize black radical thought, but instead to reframe black power synonymous with black apple. The calm before the storm, calm too murky. Money on my mind all the time is a curse from the top, I'm obsessed with paper. They 
we cutting trees, let me beef But if you ask me, I'd much rather nature So we ain't got much left to live So I get out the crib and go get my cake up Free throw like a Laker All in my court and round earth's equator before I begin, I should prefix that a significant amount of what I'm going to discuss in this section is primarily derivative of Dr. Jared Ball's The Myth of Black Buying Power book, which goes into clear and concise detail surrounding these issues. I also think it's well written in the sense that it's not especially long and you won't need a thesaurus to decipher what he's saying. Like, I don't. It's a, it's, it's a lot. It's, a lot uh, yeah. it's not my intention to steal his work and pawn it off as my own, so I think it's important that I prefix that. One of the first things he communicates is this popularized concept of buying power and how it originates from the 19th century. The concept of buying power comes originally from the government statistics generated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. This volume reports that the first century of government agency, whose founders hoped that, by publishing facts about economic conditions, the agency would help end the strife between capital and labor. It was saved for another conversation, but in terms of how it's popularly believed, buying power as a concept was developed in the late 19th century by the US government and uh, uh, the business community, specifically to figure out how to set and police wages of workers to make sure people are paid enough to not actually better their, their lot in life, but to just enough to buy the products that they were helping produce at an ever increasing rate. And what they were noticing already was in any capitalist situation, and this is when we're primarily just dealing with white male workers. So it wasn't even it wasn't even a diverse you know, labor force fully, uh, um, you know, to the extent that it is now. Just within white male workers, there was already this class conflict that was becoming more and more apparent, and more of a, of a, a, a more aware and organized labor movement of the time said, look, these government reports, going back to the very first one in 1904 that came out from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that it, 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 they were already saying, you're, uh, first of all, it was acknowledged, we're doing, the, the, the government was, and the business community was saying, we need to put these studies out so that everybody is clear, so that everybody knows exactly where they stand, so that we can moderate and make sure that wages are high enough to make sure laborers can buy the products and don't get mad enough to rebel. And from the very first report, the labor community was clear that the report was misleading and giving a false, fanciful uh, projection of what workers were being paid and what that money could actually buy on the market. The concept of buying power isn't about investment or even gaining capital. It's about advertising and a propaganda campaign to convince the general public that they actually have the means to buy these products that they're being sold. And even those same statistics were rightfully criticized. Purchasing power, which has never been about accessing the strength or potential of the working people to overcome poverty or depressed class position. From the start, purchasing power has been meant as a measurement of what workers could buy and a measurement by which leaders of business and government could work in unison to assure the workers' wages were low enough to assure the maximum profit for ownership while sufficient enough to buy enough of what is produced. Striking such a balance would create a societal peace and equally important, uninterrupted proper function of business. Yeah, like on honestly and truly though, would, would the government really, like it sounds very meticulous and specific, right? Like would the government really commission a report to justify terrible wages? Well, yeah, I, I think they would. I, I, I don't know about you, <laughs> they've done a lot. Just last year, when the world collectively remembered that the police aren't good people, Boris Johnson was very frustrated at the tearing down of statues of racist British colonizers. So he went out of his way to fund and commission a report with the intention of disproving systemic racism. I'm not joking, this ain't, <laughs> this ain't one of those things. It was a response to BLM within the UK. This ain't us, this has nothing to do with us. And while I have a video that goes into that, and there's various issues I have with the report in question that aren't really worth getting into here, case in point, it's not foreign, it's not dated, and it's nothing new. They do this. Something else Jared Ball goes into is after World War II, there was an influx of black people working in factories to create weapons. And since the government didn't want to just get rid of the factories and they wanted to use them, they decided to use them to create product to sell. The problem is, after, especially after a war, <laughs> nobody has any money to spend on these things. Government officials and policymakers had to figure out what to do with this new industrial capacity. Should the country simply close down the new factories and return to the level of output and unemployment that it had in 1940? Or should it convert the capacity to peacetime use and come up with new sources of demand to replace government armed spending? The key to avoiding mass unemployment was to ensure sufficient aggregate aggregate Okay. The key to avoiding mass unemployment was to ensure sufficient aggregate demand. As Robert Nathan, chair of the War Productions Planning Committee put it, 
If increased buying power can be gotten into the hands of consumers, who will spend it on goods and services, American industry need not worry about finding markets for all it can produce, and produce profitably. Again, we go back to this point of buying power just being a marketing tool to get people to buy products. It was, it was a concept founded on, yeah, you have the power as a consumer to shape the economic world. Like, no, honey, you're getting the bare minimum. And really, it's all really designed for you to buy things to justify the existence of this factory. But sure, you, you have that little fantasy. You get your, get your little 40 acres and a mule. <laughs> okay, 40 acres and a mule. Come on now, 40 acres. That's a lot of land. You and I both know we'll never see it. Doubling down on this idea was only further emphasized by John Haight Johnson's The Secret of Selling the Negro, which was essentially a glorified propaganda campaign for white investors, telling them that there was this gold mine that they were missing out on by not involving black people in the free market. The president of promoting an entrepreneurial class consciousness took new form with a previously unprecedented black owned and black targeting media as a driving force. Rather than supporting calls among black political movements for radical redistribution of existing national wealth, power was redefined away from political power and redistribution and towards consumption. For example, the singularly influential black media owned John H. Johnson, famously of Ebony and Jet magazines, took to promoting what would one day be the form of black power rebranded by Richard Nixon as entrepreneurialism and consumption and helped develop an approach to capturing black consumers which remain dominant today. Again, stressing, making it abundantly clear that this isn't my research, it's not my intention to take away from Dr. Jared Ball's work. You read about it more in his book. Let's keep going. I don't, I don't mind this time. Let's keep going. Why economic power brokers had to be made aware of the gold mine in their backyard. From Johnson, these influential businessmen needed to learn the secret of selling the Negro and recognize that they stood to benefit from the full incorporation and unrestricted participation of African Americans in the American free market. Johnson assured white corporate interests that the capitalist competition and robust consumerism were good for everybody, even African Americans suffering under the heel of Jim Crow. At the same time, Johnson maintained that African Americans needed to emphasize the happier side of Negro life. The, the happier side. Oh, okay. Oh. Because the individual success of one black person positively translated to the larger image and collective benefit of all African Americans. While these beliefs would clearly be articulated in his autobiography, Succeeding Against All Odds. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can, there's a lot to say about that. Uh, <laughs> we'll get back to that type of shit. Succeeding against all odds. Okay. <laughs> Okay. They were first reflected in his magazine's persistent focus on Negro firsts, celebrity culture, and stories of success. Ultimately, it is impossible to disaggregate Johnson's racial interests from its class interests, since African Americans doubled as his racial affinity group and the consumers who served as the source of his expanding wealth. Although the Negro press, including magazines as well as newspapers, claimed to be published in the interests of the race, it represents primarily the interests of the black bourgeoisie and promulgates bourgeoisie values. The most important of these magazines was Ebony, Jet, Hugh, and Tan Confessions, all of which were Johnson's productions, by the way, I should make that clear. And there was a strong history of critiques to his values, his class interests, and how, and how a lot of what he did ultimately just set political discourse back. And this is where a large majority of this myth was created and perpetuated. It's in the interest of those in power to convince, to convince you that there's, there's nothing wrong, or at least to emphasize that a large, a large amount of the responsibility is on the individual for their circumstances. Everyone loves an underdog story, the American dream, any, any, if you're into anime, any shonen anime ever, one of these, one of those isn't a good comparison. We love the narrative of the little guy working hard from nothing to reach greater and higher heights, their dreams, whatever. And to point out the flaws within an inherently rigged system is victimhood in the eyes of many. I'll talk about black radical figures, history, leaders, all of that later. Let, 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 let's go into this real quick, because it's very interesting to me. Let's say you're in a street game and there were three cups and there's a ball underneath one of the cups. Guess right and you win. Guess wrong and you lose. Now the guy who's doing the game for you, he gets rid of the ball before you pick, but give you the illusion that you're gonna win. And when you finally pick up on, hey, wait, 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 this guy's cheating, this game is rigged, why is my livelihood up to a rigged game of chance? He and everybody else laughs at you and says, you're a victim. And you sit there and you go, you know what? I think I'm a victim. Let me pull myself up from my bootstraps. And you see how that doesn't make any sense. But to point out, to point that out makes you a victim. Again, in the eyes of many. Fred Hampton pointed this out. He said that capitalism should not be fought with black capitalism. Malcolm X noted this. He compared the concept of being a liberal to being a fox, wearing a mask. MLK Jr. knew this. The Black, the black Panther organization was built on these values. Let, let's, let's ignore all of this. Let's, let's ignore all of this. Because Jay-Z exists. He, he's rich and he can rap and he's just like me. As whitewashed and liberalized as our current, massive air quotes here, 
black leadership is. There is so much deeply rooted research and conversation surrounding how this system, it wasn't built for black people to thrive. How racism is, in many ways, intrinsically linked to capitalism. And lastly, how black tokens would be used by corporate elites to mislead the public. And that's exactly what we have to talk about next. You're Puss in Boots and I'm your owner, so you just purr and follow my lead. You talking about that play? I don't want to be a dumb cat. That hasn't happened to you. I think, it's, again, again, it goes back to a, a bit of what Warren was saying as well. Like, it's the discipline as well. The discipline to not get caught up in the moment. You know, music is like stocks, too. You know, there's the... <laughs> <laughs> In the past, I've been very vocal about how I felt to how people like Killer Mike handled the violent protests following everything that happened with George Floyd. And while I did communicate that I had issues with how he was essentially telling black people to pack their bag, <laughs> he, told, he told black people, pack your bags, go home and vote. What I didn't communicate was the sheer number of people that shared this message. White people, black people, it, it doesn't matter. Everyone shared this sentiment once they saw it. It went viral very quickly. An elected black leader of sorts had go up on a podium and said, said, you know, said the thing that corporate elites and conservative white people and the like, they, they all really wanted to hear. And it, it was framed beautifully with this emotional gaslighting and all. The message was clear. Black people need to stop fighting back against the system. Go home and vote. Trust in the system to do its job. You're destroying your homes. The result of this would be very obvious. Everything would go back to normal. You got a prosecutor sent your partner to jail and you know it was bullshit. Put a new prosecutor in there. Now's your election to do it. You want a different senator that's more progressive that pulls marijuana through? Now is the time to do that. But it is not time to burn down your own home. Organize and to properly mobilize. I want you to go home. I want you to talk to 10 of your friends. I want you guys to come up with real solutions. I would like for the Atlanta City Police Department to bring back the Community Review Board. At first glance, it would seem like he's just operating in the best interests of black people. But upon further inspection, it's not that concrete. Killer Mike has been very adamant on his belief in the funding and support of black businesses and banks in an attempt to fight back against white supremacy. I'm not even sure if I'd call it like a subsection of Garveyism, and it's more just a stance that many of the blackness leadership class take. And I invest in myself and I grow business that gives real jobs to real black people. Eventually, you know, I say this to Doc and anybody who keeps criticizing me and Tip and other rappers and Puffy and Jay, they like attacking Puff J and Master P and like that. Eventually, someone is going to call you to task about what have you grown. Eventually, you're going to be asked what business you own, how many people have you hired, how have you created systemic changes in the black economy, how has it helped the greater economy? And if you can't start to answer those questions, you're going to there and by discredit yourself by, by trying to discredit others. I think that that's progress if we get more hires. We have Virgil at Louis Vuitton, Dan at Gucci, Spike and Tip were like, you need to hire more black designers so we can be influencing from the inside. So Damn it, Huey. You can't change BET from the outside. You got to change it from the inside. This is victory, brother. Now my message, our message, will get to the people. It's a sitcom called My Dad Rollo. For stars, this obviously goes against what Fred Hampton and many black political leaders of the past stood for and directly spoke against. And it's not it's not even like a plausible idea. One, if we were to combine all the minority owned banks in the world right now, it wouldn't even be in the top 16 of banks. Two, that's not how capital works. Let's say for the sake of argument that we are four people and they all rotate their money in a circle. Like that's, that's, not, that's not creating wealth. The only way in which one of us ends up with more money is if some of us end up with less money. And rotating money in a circle doesn't give us access to the global economy. It doesn't give you access to capital. It doesn't give you access to stocks. It won't give you access to land. In the form of its association with the word buying power means only the ability to spend what available money or credit is available only on the specific goods similarly made available for purchase. Having access to rims, fronts, hair, weed is one thing, while access to capital, stock, land, expanding business and so on is quite another. Black people can buy marijuana, just not the increasingly legal dispensaries emerging from a multi-billion dollar, um, almost exclusively, white industry. To acknowledge your circumstances doesn't make you a victim. To recognize your exploitation doesn't make you a victim, and anyone arguing otherwise is a shameless liar. But that's not allowed. Instead, we have to play this stupid game of black pinball politics, just to avoid bringing up the fact that this is exactly what the government wants, and it's exactly what these black radical figures of the past were warning against. I'm going to address a video that I've referenced jokingly in the past, and while I've explained at length while I'm not fond of it nowadays, I think it's honestly the perfect personification of how these values can be instilled into the minds of people. Back when I first started Operation Black Steel, I was 17. 
I've said this on several live streams, but I was agreeing. Each video feels like a time capsule to the person I was during the time. For context, it's been four years. I've just graduated. And the person I was making that video isn't the person I am right now. But what I can tell you is what I was thinking while making it. There's a cultural respect for Jay-Z. People, people would always just show me this video, talk about how Jay-Z was telling, he's telling us how to do it. He's spitting game, he's talking truth. Not just on the internet, this was, this was a really big thing. Family, friends, relatives. I had a black teacher show me this in school and say, David, that's what black power is all about. Is it? Like, is it really? I've gone on record talking about how a large catalyst for me looking into black history and radical politics was my initial fascination with the boondocks at a really young age. And it's probably a big factor into why the show's aesthetic really brandishes the channel's aesthetic, even the videos you're watching now. With time, all of that drifts off, and I became more enamored with black power movements. It was empowering, as obvious as that sounds. I had a history of anti-blackness both in my self-image and seeing it manifest in others, so learning about it was healthy for me. It was interesting. But something I'd noticed, even back then, was that there was, there was certainly like a crossroads of sorts when diving into these sorts of topics. And the ways in which black power was defined was entirely different depending on what route you took, or what route you wished to take, I'll say. In the United States today, a program of domestic neocolonialism is rapidly advancing. It was designed to counter the potentially revolutionary thrust of recent black rebellions in major cities across the country. This program was formulated by America's corporate elite, the major owners, managers, and directors of the giant corporations, banks, and foundations which increasingly dominate the economy and society as a whole, because they believe that urban revolts pose a serious threat to economic and social stability. Led by organizations such as the Ford Foundation, Urban Coalition, and Natural Alliance of Businessmen, the corporatists are attempting, with considerable success, to co-opt the black power movement. Their strategy is to equate black power with black capitalism. In this task, the white corporate elite has found an ally in the black bourgeoisie, the new militant black middle class, which became a significant social force following World War II. Black power had retroactively been made synonymous with black capitalism by corporate elites. Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon championed it to neutralize black radical thought. Johnson and corporate elites pushed the idea for the sake of their own monetary gain. And now we have the Jay-Zs, the Kanye's, the Killer Mikes. Kanye, say what you want, he's overt. He'll get on a station and tell you he's a self-made man, that he did it all by himself. I am the number one most impactful artist of our generation. I am Shakespeare in the flesh. Walt Disney, Nike, Google. Gotta perpetuate those underdog narratives that we love so much. Ooh, ooh. Jay-Z will sit down with Warren Buffett and tell you about making investments and having a plan. And I'll eat it up because that's what black power really means, right? Killer Mike will get on a podium and I'll ignore the fact that he's a landlord. I'll ignore his class interest for a second and I'll go, look, a black man is crying out, telling us to stop. We should stop. Obama is a black president and I'll ignore his subservience to the government interest because there's a black president now. The black man's leadership class rebranding and recontextualizing what black power means, either for monetary gain, the interests of the corporate elite, or perhaps just a misguided sense of view. You niggas have nothing better to watch. Complain to someone who gives a fuck. For him, the black man, there is only one way out, and it leads into the white world. Whence his constant preoccupation with attracting the attention of the white man. His concern with being powerful like the white man. His determined effort to acquire protective qualities, that is the proportion of being, or having that enters into the composition of an ego, it is from within that the negro will seek admittance into the white sanctuary. Ego withdrawal as a successful defense mechanism is impossible for the negro. He requires a white approval. Your pussy boots the one who tricks the prince. He hides who he really is and pretends to be someone else forever. But in time, he becomes that person, so his lie becomes the truth, see? He transcends the mask. Well, don't you get it? That's how he finds happiness. That's pretty good, right? You really think so? I've spoken about this concept of whiteness before, that James Baldwin called it a metaphor for power, that the buying of whiteness to be seen as equal was a real thing, that didn't mean anything, but people still did it for the sake of being seen as equals, that the concept of whiteness was created during the Bacon's Rebellion as a means of stopping multiracial solidarity, that their privileges were dished out as a means of division, that the concept of race was constructed as a means of class division, that money whitens, therefore poverty darkens. I'm not really interested in regurgitating videos I've already made. But I guess I just questioned the black misleadership class and the masquerading of black power being synonymous with, with our imitation of our oppressors. 
how much it contradicts the leaders we claim to admire, and how closely it aligns with the wishes of those who saw us as nothing more than an enemy to their political gain. I wonder. I brought up the fact that I just graduated, and the rest of the world is ahead of me now. Now it's time for me to calm down all that radical talk. But I also don't really want to participate in this system. I don't, I don't really see a happy life in it. But don't say that, otherwise you won't get I won't get sponsors. That's that's what I'm supposed to say. And now, and you're not supposed to say this because it fucks with the money. Now I'm supposed to jack up my Patreon to to five thousand, fifty thousand, and make money off this till I'm part of the problem, till I'm the issue, till I'm Killer Mike, till I'm Umar, till I reach a point where my class interests get in the way of being honest with you. You might as well make that money while you bullshit people, right? <laughs> I'll wear the white mask till someday I turn around and I become that mask and I'll convince you that this is real black power. My stability is your comfortability. My comfortability is your stability. I'm a self-made man and the only reason that you can't have what I have is because you don't invest enough in black people and you're too busy being a victim. It's bullshit. I'm probably too young to tell you what black power actually is but I know it isn't this because I know in my heart that black empowerment isn't attained in the shameless imitation of whiteness. It's attained in the liberation of ourselves and all oppressed people. And for as long as I have this platform and an interest in speaking out, I'm gonna do and say what I can. And I hope you do too. I'm just trying to help. And hey, your scowl. God help me. How can you live with yourself? How much money does it take for someone to lose their conscience? Stop being all freedom fighter and I'll give the grandfather a nice cushy job. You know, one where he has no real power, but your people are happy because he has a nice office and gets CNN. They say the beast is just an admirable guy, but I'll be doing what I do to see the family survive. Even that is not a given when I actually die. Tell my people that I miss them and I happily try. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the fun part. This is where we plug generally black eyes, but I need to make a few things clear before I do. How can you make a video arguing against black capital and plug mostly black eyes at the end? Doesn't it kind of go against the point? Oh, no, 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 nobody, no, no, sorry, Bob, the no. Well, supporting black people shouldn't be done with the caveat of we're going to build wealth. You can just support them because they're talented and, you know, they do. they deserve recognition. You don't have to believe in a myth to want to support something you like and believe in. That's black people, people of color, it really doesn't matter. Anyway, this wasn't supposed to be a 50k video, and it still isn't, but I wanted to dedicate this free Huey to the people that have supported me at all, I mean, along this weird journey I've been on. So I asked the people in my Discord server to send me their works, and that's what we're going to talk about at the end of this free Huey. Full transparency, I can talk about music, but I can't audibly play it. Let's go. Someone told me why this guy has better glitch effects than me. I was I was trying to do some system invading the video type shit earlier. I'm not sure if you noticed, but clearly this guy got the answers. I like how overtly anti-capitalistic the lyrics are. It gives me a Mortal Technique vibes, if that makes sense. Jolene, Jolen. You see the problem with me and name. I'm surprised you just sent me one. There's some really nice stuff here. I really liked in the middle synth work and music the most, but also I'm really I'm really biased so. Kyrie released a two-track EP. I really like the sentimental value of the first track chords, but I really got behind the second track on God. Music is always a really cool means of creative and artistic expression. For context, I can I can only do two colors. One color, and then I go right twice in Clip Studio, and I get the other color. So this this looks really cool. <laughs> I won't lie. This one specifically is my favorite. This is something that you see in the art gallery, and the description reads, in my thoughts. Some incredible coloring here, honestly. Even this, what the hell? You guys be messing with airbrushes. I'm out here doing the cheeky brush, brush stroke and ruins my whole piece. The fact that it still reads and works is a testament to the quality. I also really mess with the highlights within the hair. The hair detail is really what's selling me on this one. Anyone who draws Sonic is cool. Categorically, 8 times out of 10. I do battle with my distaste of capitalism and my love of Pokemon daily, but that's not even that's not even really what's sticking out to me right now. It's this. This is one of the coolest designs I've ever seen. Ever. Maybe I'm stupid. I've never seen a character depicted with this hairstyle. I love it. This is, this is one of my favorites. Has anyone seen that really weird episode of Space Dandy? That's kind of what this reminds me of. I always wonder how people are creative enough to conjure up these surrealist type of designs. Regardless, I think it's really cool. The composition here is really great too. I think it's Goki. I'm going to say Goki. I sat there for a good three minutes trying to decipher what your art style reminded me of. And then it kind of hit me. It, Skullgirls? And if you know me, I love that game and I love it and I think it's art style is incredible. But what's weird though is I feel like that's not even really doing it justice just by comparing it to that. You have a webcomic with all these dynamic shots and expressions. Like you ever see some art that just looks alive? 
Once again, Pokemon follows me, but I really, I really like that you're using the redesigns for this Boondocks and I'm assuming original character piece. I rarely see artwork featuring the redesigns because the show hasn't dropped yet. Jasmine looks really cute in a beanie. I really like that. That's a really cool detail. Dark, I don't understand why you hid this. Imagine being talented and hiding it. Imagine doing this in secret. Imagine having talent. Can't relate. I remember when you first started doing this stuff back in the Ace Attorney days. The sheer amount in which you've grown as a person and as a designer has been exponential. This stuff is disgustingly good. Like, honestly. <laughs> Shout out to you specifically. I really like you. What's funny is even before you could drop this and evacuate the crime scene, I'm glad Doc convinced you to share this because this stuff is really good. I feel like I'm running out of ways to say things are really creative and good. There's a pixel art webcomic with a dickhead penguin. There's Millie over here, clearly just worked with Studio Trigger on BNA. Quick fooly cooly. What? I don't know what this is. I don't know what studio you stole this from, but I don't know how long I've been talking about this. I'm sorry. But I guess I'm just eternally grateful and it's been really cool to be surrounded by so many talented people. Their socials will be in the video, so if you're interested in commissions or just supporting them, do your thing. Traffic is always helpful. We pray that tomorrow will be better than today. Power to the people. Peace. Bring it up.